with no further ado, please welcome Dr. Tom O'Connell. I'd just like to say that what you've heard so far today has been clinical, I mean, been uh, research and scientific aspects of uh, cannabis use. What's been lacking, especially in the United States for since 1937 have been real clinical reports, in other words, data from patients. And the way medical marijuana changed that equation in 1996 was that it suddenly made patients accessible to doctors who could then question them about their use of cannabis. The problem with that was that not all initiatives were the same, not all medical cannabis laws are the same. Most of them are very restrictive. Uh, in one way or another and limit the number of patients that could qualify. California has been the most liberal in that respect, although it hasn't been wide open. And there's probably nowhere near the number of medical users uh, that have either applied or been uh, certified as medical users that there could be. We have a substantial population. They're not accessible, equally accessible in all parts of the state, and I'll get into that, but there's a, a substantial number. And the first one is meant to grab your attention and also to stress the relationship uh, between alcohol, tobacco, and cannabis. And to suggest that perhaps it's not just irresponsible thrill-seeking and teen hedonism that leads adolescents to use these agents, but it's actually a form of self-medication. Uh, the second is also appropriate because this, was, be, this became focused on the abnormally high drug initiation rates exhibited by this population. And finally, we get back to the original title. Now, the background for this study is uh, these were patients seen in clubs. And there are really three different populations of patients uh, becoming medical users in California based on who signs that recommendation. Uh, there's no formal state list, which is a daunting process in itself, and it's one of the reasons that the application process has been easier in California. But the OCBC, the Oakland Cannabis Buyers Club, has maintained a voluntary list. And at, uh, in, in 2002, about the time this study was undertaken, they had qualified about 20,000, or they had the list of about 20,000 patients. And of course, the data was confidential, but the registrar who maintained that list kindly shared some information with me. And the first was that about a third of all their registrants came from patients with the poster diseases who had been certified by their treating physicians, either oncologists, uh, AIDS doctors, or pain specialists. These physicians feel very little qualm about signing the recommendations because it's sort of the expected thing to do. And if a patient requests a recommendation, they'll usually sign it. Another third that we hear little or nothing about had their recommendations signed by private practitioners who, as a matter of practice, only signed three, four, or five in their whole, for their whole practice, but yet they renew them faithfully. So the implication is that these are patients who either had enough political clout with their practitioner or enough money <laughs> to induce them to sign their recommendations. We know nothing about these patients. They're not reported by anybody. Actually, there have been no published reports that I'm aware of from the first group. So that leaves the third great source of recommendations, and there are these physicians who have signed many of them. Uh, some of them make reviewing these applications their only work. I'm one of those. And they see patients either in their offices or in clubs, and they have signed hundreds to thousands and they account for the other, the final third. I don't have current statistics, as I say, this is from uh, 2002. Dale Geringer, who's the head of Normal, has recently updated his estimate and now figures that there are bet between 75 and 100,000 recommendations have been signed. So this is a moving target. This particular study embraces just 622 patients who were the first entries into a database. Uh, the data's been gathered uh, 
since then, but we cut it off uh, at six months as to the group to design the database around and to report first. And this is what I'd like to cover in my remaining time. And, you know, political factors shouldn't enter into a cl clinical discussion, but when the subject is cannabis, it's a necessity. So we'll cover that briefly. This was not a planned study. It was started through some serendipitous observations in this patient group that I was made when I was trying to sort out the first six months, people not yet in the study. Uh, it required the development of a structured interview to get information from these patients because if you don't ask the right questions, they're not going to tell you anything useful. And we'll go over the data obtained from those interviews and a brief discussion of what I consider to be the significant points. Now, this, the, the ability to see these patients in clubs required an evolution. It was not something that could have been done the day after the initiative passed, or indeed for a few years. Uh, fierce resistance from all law enforcement agencies in California had produced administrative or legislative gridlock in Sacramento. No enabling legislation could get through and even if it had the, the governor then, Pete Wilson had vowed to, to uh, veto any such law. So the law was cast adrift as an orphan at first. However, impasses eventually get resolved, and this one was resolved by uh, factors that could not have been predicted at the time, but amounted to a form of local option. There were few pockets in the state that were favorable to cannabis clubs. Uh, in some of those areas, the police were able to shut them down in short order, but in other places they persisted. And as cannabis clubs developed some expertise, they developed, they, they were found to play a very valuable role, and patients would travel to them. So at the club I work at in Oakland, I have patients driving from Bakersfield and from Sacramento and from Ukiah to take advantage of the, what the club offers, which is relatively standardized pure medicine at reasonable prices and a wide variety of other products and some expertise. And also some links to services, including physicians. Uh, the, the California's uh, application process was the easiest and the wording that any physician, uh, any disease that the phys physician decided might be helped was what opened the door. There was no restrictive list of diseases. And then in an ironic factor, or ironic uh, fashion, the federal government's threat against physicians who dared speak to patients about cannabis actually worked in my, to my advantage because it channeled as many patients as I wanted to see, as many patients as I had time to see. And it was seeing this steady stream of patients that allowed me to tumble to the fact that they shared a lot of common, a lot of things in common that were not immediately apparent. The serendipity came from a cluster of insights really that originated with the first six months that I was seeing patients, I was sorting them out. They were telling me or educating me about clinical use of cannabis. Parenthetically, I didn't try pot in high school. I was much older than that. Uh, it was an exotic unknown when I was in high school. So I came to this uh, late. I'm what's known in Medicare circles as an outlier. <laughs> but it was those, uh, that relative naivete and lack of experience that allowed me to see these patients perhaps with different eyes. It began with an effort to screen out the feared recreational user. These were the people who were going to subvert the program, not real patients at all. But this facile assumption was made that there were somehow qualified medical users and everybody else was a recreational user. The unfortunate thing, there was no definition of medical use that was consistent or even reasonable. 
So in a way, this was to find out what medical use was. And my first attempt to do that uh, led me to some realizations that uh, showed me the unique value of standardized questions, asking everybody the same question and then comparing their answers. I did this with clusters of patients and gradually built up uh, the interview that I would use on everybody. And when that realization was reached, it was understood then that the standardized interview would give us crucial information in two areas. One was the uh, controversial area of cannabis role in other drug use, which of course the federal government has stressed as the reason for prohibiting it, and also might help us decide this controversial question, what is medical use to begin with? Now, serendipity began with learning that everybody I saw was a chronic user. They were all, had all been using for years, even the 18-year-olds and also the 50-year-olds. And they had been using in a similar pattern. They had all initiated in high school. And the, the hint that this might be self-medication prompted similar questions about alcohol and tobacco, which confirmed my suspicions. And when I started to ask them about other drugs, it really confirmed it. And so the aggregate of these answers, and one of the most important points I want to leave with you, is that uh, for most of these patients, their initial use of, of cannabis had almost certainly been for emotional symptoms rather than the pain syndromes that they wanted to tell me about. Uh, we weren't seeing many people with the poster diseases, so most of the patients were complaining of pain. Now, I was a thoracic surgeon for 30 years, and I inflicted a lot of pain, and I experienced, had a lot of experience with clinical pain. And I can tell you that about a third of the patients complaining of pain had very valid, believable syndromes. Another third seemed completely fanciful, and the middle third were at best squishy. However, I asked everybody to rate the importance of cannabis to, the, to their lives on a scale of 1 to 10. And they were uniformly 8.5 or better, and many were 10 plus. The people with the improbable pain syndromes were just as adamant about the importance of cannabis to their well-being as the people in pain. And then the final the cherry on the Sunday was when you did careful <coughs> chronologic backtracking of when they had become chronic users. You found out that in many instances that chronic use had preceded their pain syndrome or their illness or whatever it was they were citing as the reason for medical use by years in many instances. So clearly there had been another reason for their chronic use to begin with. Now, the practical limitation uh, on trying to extract this information in a relatively short piece of period of time. And also I'd learned that the reticence, their reticence to share information about other drugs was very palpable. So that they were not going to give me accurate information in a questionnaire. It had to be a face-to-face -face interview, had to be in private, and had to be with some guarantee of uh, confidentiality. And again, we had a practical time limit of about 45 minutes, which is about twice as long as I had been spending on the first batch of patients I saw when I was limiting my examination to the typical medical history and physical. And we had to know what the right questions were. The data had to be easy to record. You couldn't be sitting there writing and interrupting the flow of uh, information and couldn't be typing into a computer. That would be too distracting. But after a while, we designed a suitable form, one that was one page and could be scanned into a computer uh, as a permanent part of a record. And by 
early July, uh, or by, actually by the end of June, starting in July 2002, I had a, a form that I could use and a system for these interviews. This is uh, just a copy of an actual scan. The, the questions are cued by uh, abbreviations, and they can be answered with circles, uh, lines, and a, a small amount of writing. It covers the same information in the same uh, stream from every patient. What isn't, well, what isn't projected there at all is, is uh, oh, I'm sorry, we'll go on to the next one. This is the form I'm currently using. It was modified at the end of uh, December 02, and it's been in use pretty much since January 03. Data from an additional 2,400 interviews done since then has not been entered, because I haven't had the time. I'm not like Dr. Guy with a big staff uh, working entirely by myself. Now, the emphasis was on getting data that could be quasi-objective. and would have relevance in two general areas. One was their other drug use, and the other was uh, the relationship of their cannabis use to their symptoms in an attempt to define medical marijuana, just what is medical use in, in real life, not in theory or not in somebody's top-down formulation. This is demographic data. It shows that the majority were male, ratio of four to one, and that ratio has stood up uh, since this first 600 and some odd patients. It's still running four to one men. Uh, the, the age distribution is interesting because uh, between 18 and 59, uh, it's fairly symmetrical, except for that big bump of 20-year-olds. Uh, women tend to be older, and they're as I say, fewer of them. Now we can speculate about why, but I prefer to concentrate on the patients who came in, not on the ones who didn't. I, I'm aware that there are probably many other patients using cannabis in the state uh, on a chronic basis, but I can only deal with the ones who saw me. This shows that uh, most of them were uh, white males, almost 60% but that all other races were represented. And interestingly, the ratio of male to female stood up across the racial boundaries. Uh, almost everybody under 60 had initiated cannabis as an adolescent. They had all been, become chronic, obviously, at some point. Occasionally, there was an interruption. Somebody who was a chronic smoker gave it up for months or years and came back but most of them were steady once they became chronic users. Dosage, which Dr. Guy spent a lot of time on, uh, I was forced to ask about in terms of ounces per week. There's no other way that I was aware of that I could measure it in milligrams or nanograms. But what was interesting was that the, the range was extreme from a sixteenth of an ounce a week by a small handful to over an ounce by a substantial group, perhaps 10%. But the vast majority were clustered between an eighth and a quarter a week. And this seemed to be very consistent. And the other thing that was extremely interesting was the pattern in which it was consumed. Everybody used it multiple times during the day, not just once. And uh, the big dividing line was whether they used in the morning or not. There were some that inevitably used in the morning, uh, others who always avoided morning use, and a fairly substantial number in the middle that used in the morning but only on weekends and days off. And in further questioning, they reduce their dose in the morning. Those who use in the morning use less. So it's a phenomenon that Dr. Guy referred to. The patients adjust their dosage based on their needs. And the thing that was also interesting to me was trying to distinguish whether they reduced their morning dose because of fear of discovery. Being busted at work in a straight job could cost you that job. Or whether it was concern that the cognitive effects might interfere with their ability to work. Both factors work. I haven't been able to distinguish them 
with complete accuracy by any means. But clearly, the type of job and concern over cognitive function plays a role. On the other hand, there are some patients who will look you right in the eye and say, Doc, if I don't talk up with my morning coffee, I'm not worth a damn. And these are the people who have trouble focusing. And they're, they're very insistent that the cannabis is what en enables them to organize their day and get through it in good shape. And I've been getting ahead of my slides because I haven't been looking at the board. But this is what I just talked about, and I'm sorry for that. So what I came up with was this was a very stable pattern. It was just the opposite of what one would expect with recreation. It was medical, without any doubt. And that was one of the reasons I began to ask about alcohol and tobacco as well. And that was the beginning of wisdom right there. Now, this is a chart from uh, sort of a composite. My group, 100% of the patients had obviously tried cannabis because they were all chronic users. 100% had also tried alcohol. And 93% had tried tobacco. The ones who didn't try tobacco all told me it was because one or both parents were heavy smokers and they were so turned off by choking their way through childhood that they didn't bother to try. Uh, the average age is seemingly rem remarkably similar. Now, and when you compare that with national data, uh, they're strikingly, uh, th my patients tried at an earlier age and much more completely than the rest of the nation, than their peers. Now, an interesting thing that's been emphasized in recent literature is the sequence with which cannabis is used. It's the third most popularly tried drug in Ameri by American adolescents. And it tends to be tried third, although at almost the same age as alcohol and tobacco. The little gray uh, pie uh, shape at the top, 9%, that represents the people who try cannabis first. Everybody else either tries cannabis along with, uh, I'm sorry, cannabis after alcohol and tobacco or after at least one of them. Now when we tear my cohort or my group apart and place them in three cohorts based on when they were born, we find an interesting difference that the people who are older, who were exposed later to cannabis, uh, their average age at initiation was significantly higher, it was 17. Average age for initiating alcohol was slightly higher. Now these are people born between 1943 and 57, so that's ancient history for a lot of the younger patients. However, within a relatively few years, the average age at which cannabis was initiated had moved down and was almost identical with alcohol and tobacco and has stayed that way in the youngest cohort. And I think that what that reflects is the maturation of the high school pot market in the United States. The cannabis was a very rare commodity almost exotic until the 60s. And beginning with the protest movements, it became uh, sort of the symbolic drug, which many re people think is the reason that Nixon declared war on drugs. But certainly that reinvigorated cannabis prohibition and was associated with a rapid rise in the rate at which it was tried. These are lifetime use rates. And the lower line are for those under 17. Most people who are going to initiate cannabis have done so by 25. So by 19, the late 70s, we had 50% of the population having initiated cannabis, and the other 50% not. There was a minor dip, as it turns out, associated with just say no and stricter uh, prohibition during the Reagan years, and then that recovered, and it's remained rather stable since then. So this is the third most commonly initiated drug. Now obviously my population is going to reflect that availability in high school to some extent. Uh, this is just meant to show that alcohol initiation really is complete by 25. That's the peak for most people and again it's a moving target. 
This is another slide. The main thing to focus on here is how relatively few people try either cocaine or, or heroin compared to the big three, alcohol, cannabis, and alcohol, tobacco, and cannabis. The orders of magnitude differ. Now this is the alcohol experience of my group. The yellow bar are people who had no particular problem with alcohol, remained minimal or moderate drinkers. Those in blue were binge drinkers in high school and college, or as young adults. And the ones in purple were problem drinkers. They blacked out or got DUIs. That's a substantial percentage of had real problems with alcohol. And then the red uh, stripe at the top is for those who were completely intolerant. Many of them were Asians, as a matter of fact. But there are people who simply couldn't drink without getting very sick. Uh, men and women were not that different. Uh, the third uh, bar represents 112 patients who initiated heroin. And their experiences with alcohol were much more intense. I'm sorry, I'm, I keep talking ahead of my slide. Again, I'm sorry for that. Now, this is their tobacco experiences, and I tried to classify them by those who never tried it to begin with, those who became daily smokers and quit, and those who became daily smokers and can't quit, so-called inveterate smokers. And that's very interesting. The other thing that's interesting about their tobacco experience is that I didn't meet one person, I'll take that back, one, who was not sorry they had initiated tobacco. Uh, the people who can't quit are prisoners of their addiction. They wouldn't like to quit. Many of them have quit for months, even years, and gone back. And that number is surprising, that percentage is surprisingly constant for both men and women. Uh, and again, people who initiated heroin had more trouble with tobacco as well as more trouble with alcohol. Clearly, just initiating heroin was a sign of intensity of whatever symptoms they were treating. Now, when you check their initiation rates for other drugs, this was really interesting. Very high for alcohol and tobacco, and not bad for cocaine either. Two thirds of them had tried cocaine. A substantial percentage had tried meth. And although heroin was the least attractive drug, drug for them to try, at 18%, it's roughly 10 times the national average, their adolescent peers. So this was a group with a, a tremendous interest in drugs, a very drug aware at an early age. And psychedelics were even more impressive because fully three quarters of them had tried magic mushrooms, which is not a drug that gets a lot of publicity one way or the other. Uh, when you look at just white chronic cannabis users, over 90% of white men have tried magic mushrooms. I think there's a message there somewhere. The interest in LSD was almost as great, and you have to remember that the LSD market has diminished considerably over the past several years. It's harder to find. Almost 40% of them had tried either peyote or mescaline, which are essentially the same thing. And their MDA, MA experience was age-related. The older ones had not tried MDA, MA. Most of the uh, younger ones had. So again, this remains a very drug-aware group. And this, this compares the initiation rates for my group of chronic cannabis smokers in yellow with similar rates for the national average. And as we see, it's 10 times as great for, cocaine, uh, for heroin. The interesting thing was that very little problematic drug use had resulted from all this aggressive drug initiation. For most of them, it was a non-event. They tried it and moved on but they did try. Uh, most of the casualties from those initiations are represented by uh, hepatitis C. The, the people who uh, tried any drugs by injection had a high rate of uh, hepatitis C, which is not surprising. 
and I'm sort of beating a dead horse here, so I'm going to move on. But uh, the question emerged: What made these particular teens so all fired anxious? to try alcohol, tobacco, cannabis, and a host of other drugs. And at such an early age. And that's what uh, led me to ask about families, siblings, and ultimately school experiences. And the interesting finding, which just, as soon as I started asking these questions, it became immediately apparent that every one of them, just about every one of them, had a daddy problem. Uh, and the problem could be defined fairly narrowly, that their biological father, their relationship with their biological father had been impaired significantly between ages 4 and 12, between preschool and the sixth grade, in almost every case. And when you track their school experiences, their self-esteem problems jumped out at you as well. Now, what were these impairments in the paternal relationship? About 80% of them are covered by a, an absent father, either through debt or divorce, de death or divorce before the age of uh, six or seven, or an alcoholic father, or a workaholic father, or some combination thereof. Less frequent impairments, uh, but significant, were an elderly parent who's 20 years older than uh, the other kid's dads, uh, an immigrant who can't master English while the son is, or the, ch the, the child is growing up speaking idiomatic English, an invalid or an extremely passive person. But you don't have to look very far. It takes four or five questions on average. In fact, two or three. If it's divorce, one or two. Now, I'll take a break right there. This is a very, was a non-intuitive and unexpected finding, but uh, it stands up in the other 2,000 plus interviews that I've done. And what I heard over and over again was in where the marriage was together, he was never there. He was either not there emotionally or he was not there uh, physically. Uh, it, it seems to me, and I certainly can't prove this at this point, but it's entirely possible that most adolescent drug use is engaged in and persisted in by people seeking relief, unknowingly seeking relief of the same symptoms. Now we get to the issue of what is medical use. Uh, we're switching gears here a little bit. But cannabis, as it's available to people in the United States now, either through clubs or through the illegal market, as a therapeutic agent, it has certain limitations or characteristics which determine how it will be used. And this gets to what Dr. Guy was talking about, too, about dosage. Although it's effective in many clinical settings, it is a palliative. It's only for relief. It doesn't cure anything. And it's, when it's smoked, particularly, it's very evanescent. It must be repeated fairly frequently, which would explain the daytime use patterns so subscribed to by, or admitted to by my patients. Uh, the dosage, actually, when it's inhaled, that's a huge advantage of inhalation. You use your brain as a dosimeter. The blood is delivered within seconds from lung to brain, and the brain is immediately aware of the quality of the pot and how many tokes are necessary to achieve whatever that desired state is. And it's that interval between therapeutic effect and intoxication, which I submit is very poorly defined. And I certainly agree with Dr. Guy that, it's, that it's, uh, intoxication is not a problem. These people manage that very well. So I'm getting the time signal from our host. So just a word about oral ingestion. It's a different ball game orally. You have to wait at least a half an hour for digestion. And then you have the first pass through the liver, which modifies the effect of cannabis. And these patients all know that. They use edibles mostly on Sunday afternoons to go to a rock concert or a ball game when there's predictably going to be no stress. Uh, 
I've recommended that th those with insomnia give it a try. But they were raised on smoke. They like smoke. They're beginning to like vapor, the younger ones. Uh, big point I'd like to make. Cannabis is used to treat symptoms. Patients don't know diseases. They don't know conditions. But they do know that it makes them feel better. So when you analyze the, the, the conditions which they manifest, you can group them into four different groups. Somatic disease, which, such as multiple sclerosis, cancer, glaucoma. A relatively large minority, but a minority never the same. Functional disorders that haven't been talked about much today. Asthma, uh, migraine, and IBS. And there's a very interesting association between migraine and IBS. A substantial number of people have symptoms of both, and both are helped by cannabis, as well as Crohn's disease and other hypermotility disorders. Chronic pain, uh, I had to sort out those whose pain was convincing versus those whose pain was not that convincing. And I did that as an experienced clinician. But clearly when you seek the symptoms, when you ask them about insomnia, panic attacks, clammy, and you can sometimes tell when you shake hands with them <laughs> that they've got clammy hands. AM anorexia, uh, easy anger. You find that emotional symptoms are by far and away the most common cause. Even the people with the somatic diseases have those. So this is an attempt to represent that sort of graphically to show that the emotional mood disorder type of diagnosis overlaps everything else to an extreme degree. And in a graphic fashion, these are the relative frequencies. Now, the most important slide, I think, is that you know, the majority of patients are, are treating a mix of emotional and disorders and somatic disease. With most of them, clearly the emotional problems were first. The rest I'll let you read. But the idea that uh, this is a gateway drug to other drugs is dispelled, I think, almost completely by this data. It's just one more drug that a vulnerable population tries. And as far as medical use is concerned, uh, we've got to look at I just don't have time to talk about the emotional disorders. But we desperately need research to define levels of intoxication and levels of impairment. And an interesting question. What medical patient, what patient applying to be recognized as a medical smoker, didn't try cannabis in high school. That's something I'd really like to know, and we don't have data on that. Thank you. <laughs>